Hey everybody, welcome back. Today I wanted to talk to you about lobster roaches. These are a, I don't know, smallish roach. They're about the size of crickets. And they work really well as feeders for pretty much any kind of fish that you have. The adults are a really good size for like adult Jack Dempsey's down to medium size-ish Oscars. Uh, my Paku and my Oscar both enjoy eating them at this point. Uh, my Jack Dempsey's really like these guys. And the smaller ones, the babies and things, work really well as live feeders for even, you know, my guppies and angelfish and things that really don't have huge mouths. So they're a really good feeder, and I want to talk about them just because they're really, really prolific breeders. I don't know if it's going to be like this for other people, but I just want to show you a quick contrast between some of the other ones while I'm doing some maintenance. Now, I've already pulled out one of these uh, egg crates. They're, they're just getting a little soggy and gross because of the roach waste. Uh, roaches are really nice because they really don't stink. This container here, it smells, it smells vaguely like a damp forest, but that's really it. There's not like the strong ammonia smell that goes along with crickets or anything. Uh, let me see if this one has the babies in it. Yeah, so these are, you can see there's a huge variety of sizes in here for the actual young. Uh, and you can see the number of these that I got, I got about 15 of these. And at the same time as I bought these, I also got some Dubia. And I mean, you can see how pitiful this colony is. And that's partially because the Dubia have to get a whole lot bigger before they breed, but these are just much better breeders. So there's like a thousand fold growth in here, while the Dubia, there's, I don't know, maybe 30 of them in the same amount of time. Uh, my orange-headed roaches back here, I ordered uh, 15 of. They're all adults, but there's not really any noticeable breeding going on from them. Uh, and these guys just really took off. The big downside to these is that they do climb glass. You can see I'm trying back there. Uh, and that's really not hard to get around if you're doing something like a 10 gallon tank. You just take some Vaseline and smear it along the top edge here. You don't need a whole lot. They don't like how it feels. And if they try to climb past it, they just fall off. So they're pretty easy to manage. They don't really fly. The wings are I think for show for mating. Uh, so what I'm doing today is I'm going in and I'm cleaning out the egg crate, just preventative. It's, I don't know, a year old in here, I guess at this point, and I just don't want it to get stinky and I don't want it to fall apart to the point where they don't have anything to climb on. These guys really do prefer to be overcrowded, so this may look like it's just not nearly enough, but this is really their preferred living condition. Uh, they, do spread the moisture into the substrate fairly well. It's very dry here. Without them being in here, this would be just dirt dry. But with them here, with the babies crawling around and things, there's enough moisture that you get a lot of moth breeding. And, you know, they're not pantry moths, but these guys also make a really good food source for fish. They enjoy them a lot. And the actual moth larvae end up in these, like, weird hairy tubes. And you can pull them apart and pull the grubs out. And those also make really nice snacks. Uh, they're, they're pretty easy to maintain. <clears throat> Roaches in general really only need uh, choline. And basically everything else, their gut bacteria synthesize. So you can keep these guys alive pretty much entirely on just potatoes. The problem with potatoes, especially if you live someplace like I do, is if they don't get eaten fast enough, they dry out, and then nobody really wants to eat them anymore. So these guys do need quite a bit of moisture. Uh, I usually give them leftovers for like zucchini cuttings, bits of tomato that we didn't eat, uh, old lettuce, spinach, stuff like that. Uh, they are okay with dog food, but they don't seem to really prefer high protein diets like uh, orange-headed roaches and things do. So. 
I don't know, the, the biggest thing that I found for these guys, especially if you're gonna try to do something really cheap, like just potatoes, is they're gonna need an extra source of water because the potatoes are gonna dry out. So I like to use the uh, water crystals from the garden center that you mix in with the soil. Uh, don't mix them in, you just hydrate them and drop them in here and they'll crawl over and eat them for extra water. Don't put water in directly because they'll crawl in it and drown. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and shake these out the rest of the way so that I can get these egg crates out and I'm gonna cut some new ones down because when you buy egg crates, they're the same height as the tank and obviously having them at the top, they'll crawl out and get everywhere. So I need to lop these in half and uh, I had three in here. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and pack this whole thing with them side to side. And while I'm doing it, I'm going to be pulling the dead ones out. It's dry enough here that they dry out very quickly. So what I'm gonna be doing with the dead ones is uh, grinding them in my little portable grain mill and I will actually be using the powder to make some fish flakes. Uh, part of that is going to be a baking process so I don't really need to worry about whether there's bacteria or anything in here because it's all gonna die. Uh, but it's something that the fish seem to enjoy a whole lot. Most of the fish that I have have large degree of insects as their natural diet so the chitin that's left over in these is not an issue. And I can show you in a minute that uh, basically they're still pretty meaty inside even though they're dry, like they weigh nothing. But these guys, because they don't really like high protein stuff, they don't do a great job of eating their dead. So you can see them in here. Uh, you know, something like the orange heads over here, you're not gonna find a whole lot of meat left in the dead ones, but these ones, it's basically just a bunch of bug jerky. So I'm gonna go ahead and finish the maintenance and uh, We'll pop upstairs and look at that. Okay, so that's all done. Uh, you just take these and carefully smack them against the side of the glass and all of, you, all of them will just fall off. Uh, you just need to be careful that there's not a whole bunch of them up here that you're gonna accidentally crush while you do it. These guys, I think the thing that makes them breed really well is they seem to have a high enough metabolism to breed pretty well even in colder areas. So this room is between 70 and 74 degrees generally. Uh, that's not a great temperature for a fish or a bug room. Really you want it warmer than that, but my wife has uh, pretty bad intolerance to heat. So being 70 to 74 I think is part of the reason that a lot of these take so long to grow while these guys are just absolutely flourishing. So if you're not keeping a warmer room for feeders, these guys do really well while everything else just kind of struggles to do anything because they really want a warmer temperature than this. So I've gone ahead and mixed these up with just some dried mealworms, about a 50-50 mix, just so there's enough to really be able to get them into the blender well. Uh, looks like I might have caught a moth or two in there. Oh well. These are uh, real easy when they're dry. Uh, they make milling blades for a lot of blenders. This is the uh, Vita Bullet, I think. It's just a more powerful magic bullet. I use it just pretty much exclusively for doing this, then I've got a separate blade that we use for coffee. Uh, but you just... And that milling blade gives you a really nice fine powder that works really well for either doing flakes or pellets or wafers, whatever you want to do. Uh, so I will be saving this and using it later in another video on some DIY foods. And just to illustrate how exceedingly edible these are, this is an adult. Uh, my peritalopia are not terribly large yet. Uh, it's hard to get a real good picture from this with the glare of the light, but you can see he's, I don't know, two, three inches long. He's the bigger one. And, uh, yeah, that's fine. They are perfectly capable of eating them. He is... 
hiding back here while he does it. But they don't have any problem with them at all, and they're just not very big fish. So I hope that's something that, uh, I don't know, is informative. I, it's not really informative, it's just showing off some of the bugs I have, I guess. Um, I'm gonna be starting on a couple weird projects coming up. Uh, I've gotta make a sand filter for the big tank because my previous filtration method is just, it's fallen behind. I had an issue where I decided not to change one of the filter floss areas for a couple of weeks because I just felt really awful. And as a result, I'm just constantly playing catch up, trying to get the stuff out. And it's not really gonna be possible to do that without changing the stuff every 12 hours at this point, and I just, I don't, I don't want to do that. So, um, because I've got a whole lot of computer equipment that I'm going to be hooking up, that I'm going to be using uh, water cooling, basically to transfer the heat from the computers into the tank, I'm going to be taking out the heat pump, because it's not going to be needed anymore. So, where the heat pump currently is, I'm going to be putting in a large 55-gallon sand filter, and I'll be doing a build video on that, assuming it works, although... I can't think of any reason why it shouldn't. And I'm also going to be starting on the actual Paku tank. So there'll be a lot of videos for that coming up. And I don't know, if you guys want to see the other stuff that I've got in the way of bugs and shrimp and crabs and stuff, you know, maybe I'll make some videos on those along the way. Anyways, uh, thanks for sticking around, and I'll see you guys next time.